Hello everyone and welcome to Next Generation Policymakers. This event is brought to you by Interreg Europe and its policy learning platform. I'm Raluca Toma and I will be your host today. We will spend together an hour and a half and in this period we will talk about you. What is your role in policy making? What are the challenges that you are facing and how can we help you better, uh, better perform? But before we start with all that, I wanted to see a little bit and to hear more about you. Who are you, the people that are joining us today? So I will ask you to use the chat that you have at your disposal in Zoom to tell us a little bit more who you are, where are you joining this event from, and what is your number one challenge when you think about your daily tasks and working on developing regional policies? It would be great to uh, have this speak into everybody that is joining us today for this webinar. So, as I was saying, you joined the next generation policymakers, and we will talk about your challenges and about possible solutions to these challenges that you are facing. In the upcoming an hour and a half, you will hear from 10 talented speakers. And by the end of this 90 minutes that we will spend together, you will hear and see what it takes to become the next generation policymaker. So I can see that you have started using the chat to tell us a little bit more about who you are and what is your role in the policy making. And thank you very much for that. And I would like to present to you now a little bit the structure of this event, how we will be working. This event has two parts. We will look a little bit into what are the macro uh, challenges in your daily tasks and what is the, we will try to set the scene. And then we will hear some testimonials from people like you that are working on regional development policies. And we will hear from them how they have used and benefited from the policy learning platform services. So it's my pleasure to now introduce to you the panel of speakers that you will hear, uh, that you will hear from next. I will start in the order of appearance with Erwin Siveris, who is the Program Director of Interreg Europe. Hello, Erwin. Hello, Valuka, and welcome. Thank you, Erwin. Then we will hear from Lisa Witter from Apolitical. Hi, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Hello. Then we have Piret Tonuris from OECD OPSI. Hello, Piret. Hello. Hello and welcome. And Torsten College, who is representing the Policy Learning Platform. Hello, Torsten. Thank you, Haluka. Welcome, everybody. They will be the, the people that will set the scene and deliver the keynote speeches at the beginning of our event. Then we will hear, as I was saying, from people like you that are working on, develop, on policies, regional development policies. So we will go and we will travel a little bit around Europe. We will hear from Rumiana from Bulgaria, from Stara Zagora. Hello, Rumiana. Hello, Ruka. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here with you today. Thank you, Rumiana. Then we will also hear from Herman. Hi, Herman, from Andalusia, Spain. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Herman. They, their conversation will be moderated by my colleague, Katarina Krell. Hello, Katarina. Hello, good afternoon. Then we will go to Italy to Lorenzo Sabatini from Tuscany. Hello, Lorenzo. Hello, good morning to all from Tuscany and welcome to the, this meeting. Great, thank you to be with us. And last but not least, we will travel to Greece and we will discuss with Lambrini. Hello, Lambrini from the Central Hello. Macedonia region. Hello from the Central, Central Macedonia. Happy to be here with you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Lambrini. 
in the meantime, I can see that you have you have used the chat and had noted some of the things like where do you come from and what is the number one challenge for you these days. I see that we have somebody from uh, Metrex, the network of European uh, Metropolitan. Oh, sorry, the, the chat is as you are writing. I cannot <laughs> see anymore what I was just reading. So, but it's Metrex, the network of European Metropolitan Regions and Areas. Uh, I also see somebody from Kalarash. So hello, Kalarash. I see Miranta, uh, planning officer at the Department uh, of Planning. Uh, um, and I also see Gabriela Nagy. Hello, everybody working on biodiversity. I cannot take the time to briefly say hello to all of you, but thank you so much for having introduced yourselves. And throughout this webinar, there will be plenty of occasions for you to ask your questions. So please don't hesitate to use uh, the chat. Um, in the same course of getting to know you a little bit more, we also wanted to launch uh, two polls with two questions. And with the help of my colleague Lotte, we will launch now the first poll. And the question is, what is the most effective way for you to stay up to date in your policy field? Do you usually participate in events? Do you read relevant publications? Do you watch videos and webinars? Do you get ad hoc advice from experts and peers? Do you receive thematic newsletters? Do you like those? Or do you like to navigate on specialized websites? So hopefully you had time to select your choices and we can maybe see the results for this poll. I can also tell you that we run the same poll on LinkedIn while preparing this event. And over there, we have seen that from 100 of responses or so, most of you were getting their uh, input uh, from, um, from newsletters, videos, and webinars. So I'm curious to see if this is the case as well for today's audience. Lotte, maybe we can close the poll and see. Okay, so now we see the results of the poll and we see that, uh, well, uh, that's close, close by. A lot of you participate in events. Some of you read relevant publications, uh, most of you actually, watch videos and webinars 41%. Uh, then we have received thematic newsletters again with 45%, navigate on specialized website 43%, and get ad hoc advice for, from experts and peers 24%. Well, by the end of this webinar, you will hear about maybe possibilities, more possibilities in order to get ad hoc advice from your peers, and we can only encourage you to also explore those. So thank you very much for this input. And the second poll questions that we have for you is, do you have time to invest in continuous learning and to build your professional capacity? We know time is always uh, a scarce resource. So we look forward to hear if yes, you do find this time to invest in continuous learning to a certain extent or not at all. So please pick your choices. And then again, I will ask my colleague to maybe close down the poll now and to see what are the answers. I'm very curious about that. So uh, luckily we are to some extent and not so much knows. Uh, only 6% don't find time for that. So we are in the right place with the right people. We will have some convincing to do maybe uh, about why you should invest time and resources into capacity building. But it's good to know that most of you already find a certain extent this time. So thank you very much for having participated to this polls that allow us to get to know you a little bit more and also to prepare uh, the discussions that will follow, uh, that will follow shortly. Um, now, with no further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Erwin for the welcome speech, following which we will start with the first part of this event, the keynote speeches. But first, the floor is all yours, uh, Erwin, for the welcome. Yeah, thank you, Raluca, uh, and all, welcome to all of you. I'm happy to see more than 100, 117 uh, participants from all over Europe. Um, very welcome also to the uh, keynote speakers, uh, Piri and Lisa, but also for the other speakers from all corners of Europe, uh, which uh, witness their practice they have to show their practice, how to use it uh, with the tools um, Europe offers, but also the program offers. Let me uh, use the two minutes I have to briefly explain the program, what is the purpose of the program. 
So Interreg Europe, as you see on the slide, is a program which allows cooperation with regions all over Europe, meaning EU Europe plus Norway and Switzerland. We have a budget of about a little bit less than 400 million euros. The regions can work in all six priorities of the program. What are we doing? We allow using the knowledge, the skills, the regions have to offer. Because we believe that for almost every problem a region faces, we have a solution in one of the many more than 270 regions in Europe, which can be used, a solution which works, a solution which proved to work, which can be shared and can be adapted and partly implemented in another region. So we believe that sharing, using the skills of Europe, um, we, we Gaza, is a good investment and a good first start before making decisions in doing investment in deciding then how to solve a problem. We have in principle two pillars of activities. One uh, uh, number one is the project. Uh, many of you know uh, this project's uh, way of uh, sharing, learning from each other for years. Uh, the regions have time to exchange with each other then uh, decide on uh, um, policy solution and then should uh, within about one year implement the solution and reporting the challenge to us, uh, the, the change, the policy change to us. The second pillar is the policy learning platform and uh, this policy learning platform, this event is an event of the policy learning platform. Um, here we allow, and I uh, will further explain, Thorsten will further explain it later, that the uh, treasure of solutions we have are further shared. Quick um, on the policy learning platform, um, three main pillars of the policy learning platform. We have a huge community. I mentioned already uh, about 300 regions in Europe with many thousand practitioners who have knowledge, who can share, who are willing to share their, their solutions. We have uh, the tool for getting specific policy advice uh, with our thematic experts. And here in our event is Katharina Grell, who will also help um, and uh, guide us a little bit to this meeting, uh, feed in in this, in this meeting today. And uh, then to find policy solutions with tools we have, but uh, Thorsten will later on further uh, explain all the uh, solutions the policy learning platform offers. So with this, I would like to remain. I uh, wish you a very successful uh, event. We are talking about, we're dealing with skills, with knowledge and networks. Everything is essential in our program. Everything is essential to bring Europe forward. Uh, all the best and uh, good luck. Thank you very much, Irvin, for this brief introduction into the what is the world of Interreg Europe and then specifically about the policy learning platform. Indeed, we will hear more about specifically the policy learning platform a little bit later. Uh, and the services and how they were uh, tested and lived by some of you. But for now, let's start with the keynote speeches. And uh, here is how we will function. You will hear uh, three short keynote speeches. Um, and after uh, this key, three keynotes, we will have question and answers uh, from myself, but also from all of you. So don't hesitate to note down in the chat as we go along, whatever questions you might have for our speakers. And now I would like to introduce to you our first speaker. So she describes herself as a serial political and policy entrepreneur. She is the co-founder and the board member of Apolitical, who is a global peer-to-peer -peer learning platform that is used by over 200,000 public servants worldwide. She's an author, a former public servant with deep experience in behavior science, and has founded numerous political leadership incubators over the past 25 years. So please welcome Lisa Witter. Lisa, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And what an honor and every single one of you public servants for doing that, for serving the public. But you can do with your life and doing something for yourself is really what we 
supporting of a political. I want to the story for best holiday time of year where someone's doing some cooking coming up, right? I wanna tell the story of a, of a woman who's cooking a meatloaf. She goes to put the meatloaf in the oven and um, her partner walks by and says, uh, why didn't you close the door to the oven to cook the meatloaf? And the woman says, well, my mom always um, has the door crack when you cook meatloaf. That's why it's so moist and juicy. And, and he's like, that's kind, of, that's kind of weird. I don't understand that. And so, She's like, well, maybe I'll call my mom. So they call the mom and they get on WhatsApp and they said, look at our oven. I, I, you know, you told us how to do this. Yeah, yeah. You always have to have the the, the door open um, when you cook the meatloaf. But but that's kind of weird, right? Oh, no, no, you do it. That's how grandma did it. So we we need to do that. So leave the, the door open. And then, so they decide to call grandma. Luckily, grandma's on some chat or they call her on the phone and grandma, why? I mean, why do you do that? And she, grandma said, that's crazy that you leave the door open. When I cook the meatloaf is because we had a really small oven in a big pan. And that's the only reason we did that. And I think that's exactly what's going on today, often in governments, is we have these old way of thinking and doing things that many of us haven't thought, you know, we just inherit it down and down and down about why to do that. And that's why we're talking about the next generation of policymakers here. We basically have 18th century politics, 19th century government. 21st century technology and 21st century challenges and opportunities, which is exactly why I want to give you five points on why continuous learning is so important um, to not just your career, but um, the health and well being of the planet and the citizens of Europe. So, first, I want to say number one that we hear from public servants at Apolitical that this is important. 80% of them say they don't have the skills to do their job, 80%. And more than 75% say they would like to receive more digital training skills. So a big why is there are new things, right? New tools, new challenges, data, tech, visualization, intense complexity, and citizens' expectations are changing, right? If they have an app to get something done, then they also want things to be easier to engage with their government. So number one is new tools and challenges. Number two is we can. You can, as we say um, in, in the US, although I'm, I've been living in Germany a long time, but you have the saying, I'm sure you have it in your culture, you can teach a dog, um, an old dog new tricks. We know with brain plasticity that adult learning not only is possible, but really possible. Like you can, if you do the right pedagogy, um, adults can learn very, very quickly. And you don't necessarily unlearn, you have to learn on top of all of the information and patterns and habits that are there. The third reason is we know more about how to do it. So we know that the brain can stretch and we can learn. We know more how to do it than ever. There's deep, deep adult pedagogy behind it. We know, for example, exactly like this event, that when you bring peers together, they're more likely to learn. We know when emotions are involved, it sticks to the brain. We know that adults need to discover on their own. They need to also do the old school learning. They need to have discourse between one another. And they need to actually do things through simulation and hands-on learning. We know that. And we know when that happens, 84% of the folks we work with say they're able to apply lessons from their peer learning right away. So how you learn together, you can apply it right away. And it can be fun. Serious issues like accounting or tech or trade or taxes, you can use the best in pedagogy to stretch your brain plasticity to actually learn how to do your job. The fourth is we are more networked in the world than we've ever been before. Just think here on this, taking us on a tour around Europe. We don't have to start over again. We can learn from others. So quick examples. We saw that when we um, brought together some folks working on how to use AI to do or machine reading of laws, the four other countries came together and started learning together. Okay, if you did it like this in New Zealand, how can we do it in our country? So you can learn together through successes and failures on gender. We ran a fellowship exchange where for the first time ever, someone in LA had mapped what gender looks like in their government and helped someone in Cordoba, um, Argentina do it, but do it better, You know, learn from the challenges of doing it. Refugee integration policy. We had a city in Australia say, I wanna go ahead and do this because I can learn from great people in government in Europe and the US. Same with agile governance. You know, How do we move quickly and differently in order to do our work? And then finally, I think the most important is all of us are sort of looking at the democratic trends is we must, you know, in order for democracy to thrive, 
we have to deliver on democracy. And the number one thing we keep hearing about what we need to learn is a lot of the you know, things like communications, getting buy-in and understanding. We need that democracy flywheel where citizens elect the politicians, the politicians then give the mandate to the civil servants and the civil servants in collaboration with the citizens deliver on democracy. We must keep learning to do that and keep up with expectations. And then finally, I'm gonna leave you just in the words of public servants, the top 10 stories of the year so far about what public servants are saying is important for them to learn by helping each other learn. First is BS, won't swear, erodes trust. Why we do it and how to stop it. That front is in the public servant context. Second is how to interview for the civil service. You can keep learning how to do that. Third, three ways to have a productive work day in the public service. That day-to-day -day soft skills, how do you work? Four, the introvert superpowers your team needs, right? Thinking about team dynamics, how to learn to be more inclusive of different learning styles. Five, a summer reading list for public servants, 2022. Where are the people reading and how can I be reading and sharing what I'm learning? Number six, inclusive workplace language, how to be more thoughtful about our words. Seven, the art of writing a good memo. I'm sure many of you spend a lot of time writing a, writing memos. How do you refresh your skills? Keep learning every day, make it fresh and fun. Eight, six things to know about your project manager in the public sector. Nine, the future skills you need to be an effective public service. And number 10, why dat, data literacy is the key skill for public servants. So public servants are learning, they must. Democracy depends on it. It can be fun and, and uh, we always have to ask, why are we doing things the old way? Maybe you don't have to crack the door in the oven to have the meatloaf work. Maybe we can do new things in new ways. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I think we this meatloaf will stay with us. It will be next generation policymakers and how to how to deliver a good meatloaf. Uh, we will all uh, use this maybe metaphor up until the end of the up until the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for this uh, keynote speech for pointing out for us why we should be interested in continuous learning and equally what are the 10 things that are of most interest to public servants out there out of from the experience of a political um, we hear from your speech and we see it and this is one of the reasons why we wanted to put together in this webinar not only the policy learning platform and interreg europe but also other organizations that are working towards the same goals meaning how to how to improve and how to offer to public servants uh, the services and uh, the skills that can help them better do their jobs so thank you again for this keynote speech we will now go to our uh, to our second speaker. She has been working on the topic of innovation within the public, uh, private sector, and academia for 17 years. Uh, during this time, she has been involved and led a variety of innovation teams in different organizations, both analyzing complex challenging, initiating their solutions, and evaluating innovations. She is the innovation lead at OECD Observatory of Public Service Innovation. So please welcome Piret Tonerist. Piret, the floor is yours for your seven minute speech, please. Thank you so much, Raluca. I will start with, with everything that is simple will be optimized. And that is very lucky that in the public sector, we are not in charge of simple problems. So we are in charge of complex issues and complex problems, and this is the nature of why they're delegated to the public sector. So this means that we continuously have to learn and innovate because it's part of the job of public sector and policymakers in its entirety. This also is reflected in recent trust surveys that the OECD has conducted, an out outlining that if people trust that public sector and civil servants are able to innovate, they also trust how the government can perform. So if you are responsive to new needs and uh, activities that come up, then also citizens are more likely to trust the government and trust you to do your job well. So first of all, innovation is part of our job. And is, there is no way to do innovation and to innovate if you're not learning continuously to begin with. And as I said, we are kind of in a situation of poly crises and complexity of energy crisis, health crisis, uh, climate crisis, which means that our challenges are extremely systematic and cascading. 
So we need to actually invest in lots in systemic approaches. So understanding systemic thinking and how different policy solutions actually cascade. And this requires also um, thinking in systems for policymakers to also think in systematic approaches to also launch how we reach goals. So European Union has a high level um, political goals of uh, obtaining missions, having missions approaches, but that requires also for us to work in different ways for us to actually work across the silos in government that we have built to reach the outcomes that we want to reach, be it the smarter cities with more inclusive growth or otherwise. So at the OECD, we're also working together with different countries. We have a mission action lab to actually see what those methodologies and organizational structures that need to be, because learning and being able to use that learning is not only the individual's job, it is also for the organization to provide the right structure, organizational form, that you can actually work in new ways and deliver in new ways as well. So currently in Austria, for example, we are looking at how different missions translate into national emissions, into teams and structures that allow them to do this kind of purpose-oriented, very specific way to deliver on those ambitious goals. We need uh, to have also intelligence and strategic intelligence about future challenges that are upcoming. Uh, I lead uh, the work on anticipatory innovation at the OECD as well, and we see the importance of strategic intelligence rising every single day. And the way to actually do that, there are different methodologies to use that from horizon scanning, from visioning, from very different approaches, but also have collective intelligence. So Relika's question in terms of where do you get the information, new information uh, for your job really resonated with me because it really highlights where there's kind of new weak signals or very strong signals about change upcoming that need to be uh, taken up. Uh, where do, does that information actually come from? Do you have a structure to do strategic foresight within your organizations? So we're trying to put that in place in different contexts. So for example, in the government of Ireland, we are uh, kind of rolling out the full program of what strategic foresight means for policymakers across the public sector, from the national government to the regions, to also municipalities, to the school teacher uh, in uh, Dublin as well. So what does it mean to actually engage with looking at new types of opportunities and also risks to how we organize work or what our values in the context of public sector are. So what does this kind of competency framework actually look like and how we integrate strategic foresight anticipation into that, to picking up signals, but also using those signals in our day-to-day -day work. And lastly, in a really big area as well, is that public sector is not going to deliver on the complex challenges that we're facing and also kind of the new challenges that are upcoming alone. So the big, big area here is ecosystems, working together with broader ecosystems inside government, but also broader in terms of civil society and also companies, businesses, and partners from your own country, from your own region, but also across countries. So ecosystem management and having a future-oriented <clears throat> ecosystem manager is really important. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> or the approaches that we on the level. And for that regard, we also need to have a common portfolio approach on how to use structure your know, innovations. So together with the Latvian government, for example, we have developed a kind of a ecosystem management approach. So how to actually develop technology-based ecosystems for innovations that are important for the government or important for the for the development of the eco development of the uh, social economic structure within the country itself, and that kind of having those kind of facilitation and tools to work beyond your own organization to connect with stakeholders beyond public sector is extremely valuable and useful now to actually deliver on the goals and the challenges that we work on. We will publish the report in January, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, share this with you as well. And last but not least, to actually work together with risk and resilience. So currently I'm sitting in the Flemish government uh, uh, to also talk about how to <coughs> integrate strategic foresight 
into resilience or recovery plans and what kind of skills and capacities that actually takes in practice to make it happen. So to sum up, uh, to have the ability to anticipate and use strategic foresight in your work uh, will be extremely important to having skills in systems approaches, to having skills and capacity to go beyond your own organization and facilitate and use design and human-centered design approaches with ecosystems uh, are going to be extremely important to you to actually deliver on future policy challenges. Uh, thank you for now and happy to discuss further. Thank you very much, Piret, uh, for this uh, keynote speech on uh, more like innovation and how is this embedded in the development, the skills of the public servants. Um, so uh, Piret is there uh, to also take questions, as I said uh, prior uh, to the launch of this session. Don't hesitate to type in your questions in the chat and we will uh, take them after we hear our third speaker. He has been working for more than 20 years in the field of European cooperation. In this period, he has fulfilled different roles, working for regional authorities and program management bodies in Germany, Poland, Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Since 2018, he manages the policy learning platform of Interreg Europe. He is a dedicated and a passionate believer in networking and exchanging knowledge, but also understands the challenge and constraints public administration are facing. It's my very pleasure to introduce now Torsten, my colleague Torsten. Torsten, the floor is yours. You equally have seven minutes, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Raluca. Thank you for the introduction. Just to reconfirm, you can hear me well? Yes, perfect. Well, but I, I would like to start, Raluca, if you allow, by expressing uh, my gratitude to, to our two keynote speakers, Lisa and Piret. Thank you for making the cases uh, for collaboration, for peer learning, for um, collective intelligence, for innovation. We know the buzzwords. Therefore, I think when now diving deeper into the policy learning platform, I do not have to repeat these mantras. Actually, dear colleagues, dear participants, I would like to take a different angle because I believe, and I have seen in the chat, many of you, many of you work in cooperation, participate in projects, but I think you agree when we walk through the hallways of, of our regional council, of our city hall, we often hear skeptical remarks about cooperation. Indeed, sometimes we hear, well, sounds nice. This is something we can do if we have time. Or we may hear, Wow, you can travel to a nice destination. Sounds like administrative tourism. What else? Very often we hear, we are one of the most advanced regions in Europe. What we, should we learn from others? Or even if you believe in the value of cooperation, you may say, well, Yes, it's nice, but will this really help me? Will this really help us, our organization, our region, and our day-to-day -day work? Therefore, and last but not least, we also hear when talking about Interreg, European projects, oh my God, I have to draft all these reports, I have to prepare an application. This is too much for me. What I believe, and I think uh, both Lisa and Piret have already made the case, I mean, we do not have to list all the crises again. We live in exceptional times, dear colleagues. Side remark, I saw in the chat uh, participants from Ukraine joining and my very warm welcome. Thank you for joining our webinar, our event today. We all know about the challenges and the world is going faster and faster and public administrations, policymakers, they have to react more and more quickly. We have to be agile, we have to be flexible. We all know the buzzwords, but this also means for us European pro uh, programs that we have to be agile and flexible. We offer project funding, but as presented by Urban Zivaris, by our program director, we have the policy learning platform as the second pillar of the program. And now you may think another platform, another database, please. I have seen dozens of outdated platforms and databases on the World Wide Web. Therefore, indeed, let me reconfirm, dear colleagues, dear participants, we are more. 
because we need to be, yes, we need to be quick, we need to be easily accessible, but we also have to provide tailored knowledge. Indeed, what we offer has to help you in your day-to-day -day work on the ground, in your city, in your region, in your country. And this is why for the second pillar of the uh, Interreg Euro program for the policy learning platform, we have set up the platform with a dedicated team, team of experts working on the different policy areas you are handling from research and innovation to the competitiveness of companies down to the green challenges, the green topics. You will meet Katarina, for instance, later. Today, we have colleagues dealing with communication, web development, and administration. Why? Because you all know Google. You can try to find the information you need in Google, but we all know we can get lost very quickly. We might be overwhelmed with information, and still, at the end of the day, we may not get the information we need. But at the policy learning platform with our team, first of all, we look into good practices available. You remember the figures presented by Irwin, more than 3,000 good practices available. Our experts, they look at them, they validate them, but we also listen to you. What are your concrete needs? We do our best to provide tailored solutions, tailored answers with the different services we offer. We will discuss uh, them later today. Important to say it is not about projects or platform. For sure, we need both. Only with projects you can work on concrete policy challenges in a strategic and systematic way over three or four years. But again, given uh, the, de the demanding times um, we, we are experiencing with the policy learning platform, with the different tools we offer from policy briefs to workshops to peer reviews, we can respond very quickly and we can provide ad hoc advice. And what I would like to, uh, to share with you um, as the last point of my speech, Indeed, what we experience with every peer review, every workshop we offer, specific or very special spirit of cooperation. Indeed, peer learning, and I, I'm sure Lisa and Piret will agree, is hard work. But as you said, Lisa, hard work should not stay in contradiction to fun. Policy learning, peer learning, developing systematic strategic intelligence can be fun. For instance, if you look to the left, no, we did not uh, team up on a camping ground. We met at an incubator in Berlin. You know, Berlin has very lively, very vibrant startup community, but the city government was wondering how could we better support our startups. We have the European Regional Development Fund. We have the European Social Fund. Let us better use the programs we have to support startups, the internationalization of startups. Therefore, we organized an interregional peer review, one of the first we had back in 2019, at an incubator meeting startups, discussing their needs, and hence drafting recommendations for the city government how to better adjust and align their regional funding programs to their needs. Indeed, as I said, peer learning is hard work, can also be fun. In the middle, we see all the participants from a recent thematic workshop we had in Thessaloniki in Greece on the topic of behavior change and participatory processes for sustainable mobility. And I think, dear participants, dear colleagues, the title already shows we want to provide tailored information, tailored knowledge, directly addressing not uh, your needs. Not talking about mobility in general, but addressing very specific challenges. We already stressed the importance of getting the citizens involved, ensuring stakeholder involvement in the long run, and those questions, among others, they were discussed um, in Greece. In June this year, and last but not least, I think very nice example for the spirit we have in our activities. We moved to the north, so from the Mediterranean to the North Sea, to the region of Westland in Norway. Two years ago, they were in the process of launching their new innovation strategy. They called upon the policy learning platform, our team of experts for support to find peers, supporting them in drafting the new innovation strategy, very strong focus on the green future of the region. 
Indeed, in, after the peer review, the peer review was held online due to the corona pandemic. They launched the strategy building on the recommendations given by our team of peers, I think colleagues from the Netherlands, from Greece, from Sweden, we had on board. And they came back to us saying, listen, dear colleagues, we would like to share the progress met, uh, made with our group of peers. And we wrote to the peers asking, would you be interested to meet the colleagues from Norway again? Because we all know you, your calendars are full. You do not have much time. Would you be ready again to allocate your precious working time to such peer review exercise supporting the colleagues in Norway? And I was more than pleased. Nearly all peers responded positively within three days. Hence, we organized the second meeting for their meeting in Bergen in Norway face to face, discussing the progress made, but also new challenges like continuous stakeholder involvement, how to monitor and evaluate the success of the strategy, how to ensure financing for innovation, just to give an example. And I think this is what we can offer with the policy learning platform, tailored support, hard work with the element of fun, and very specific, specific, very unique spirit. In this regard, enjoy the webinar and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Torsten. So you finished and rounded up and also presenting what are some of the services with some examples of what the how the policy learning platform can help out with all the challenges ahead for the policymakers. Uh, I, as I mentioned prior to all of you talking and giving your speak, keynote speeches, I encourage everybody to type in their questions and we will uh, soon go to Eugenie to hear a question maybe from the audience, but I would like to kickstart with a question of my own to uh, all of you. And you all spoke a little bit and mentioned some of the challenges that today's world uh, uh, and the policymakers are facing. And in order to face all those challenges and to deliver uh, appropriate policies, the question would be, what do you think are some of the skills uh, that are vital uh, for policymakers today and tomorrow? Maybe I take it in the order in which you have spoken. So let's go first to Lisa. Yes, first you have to unmute. I suppose this is what you are. Oh, I am. For. I am. It got it got hidden behind the bar. Um, thank yeah. you, um, Pirat and Torsten, for that. For that. Um, I'm always so energized to hear people talk about learning, right? And I, 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 I want to bridge a little bit your question to. We just did a podcast. We have a podcast called A Political Hope, and we were interviewing on the mental health, this is gonna seem like a stretch, but on the, on the mental health and well-being of politicians and saying, what's the cost of such high sort of stress on our political leaders? And Victoria Hassan um, studies this. And one of the things she said is the high cost um, on our political leaders of the sort of stress that they're in is that important issues like democratic innovation and upscaling of public servants drop to the bottom of the list because they're dealing with the urgent and not necessarily the important. And I think there is really mandate for us to be talking about how do we move this up higher on the agenda? We really, really need new and different skills um, and order and new ways of working, right, um, to do that. And which leads me to, we did a, um, a future tracker. So you can kind of look at what are those skills that you need for the future and do you have them connected to some of the things that Pierre was saying. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just quickly list them. And we heard this from Torsten. Agile and adaptable, right? You have to be able to, as the Australians say, steer and implement change, right? You have to be able to do that. It's the Canadians call it a, a competency of adaptability experimental we shouldn't call it that it's just simply trying new and different things thinking outside of the box really important to have that mindset um, and to have that growth mindset that if you make a mistake that's going to happen if you're trying new things carefully curiosity has to fuel our work as public servants deeply curious about the citizens and about how to do our work differently and that's where learning really lights up in the brain is that curiosity muscle being proactive is, is really important, um, that's number four. Five is persuasive, which is really about um, communications. We hear a lot that the number one skill public servants want is better communication skills. It's the number one course people take. Cooperative, 
um, the Kenyan um, framework states that civil servants need to bring diverse viewpoints together. So it's easy to be cooperative, as Torsten was saying, when everyone gets, but what about someone who has a different point of view? And it's often in that different point of view, you can often get a breakthrough, as we heard from one of the top 10 stories being about, you know, how to listen to the introverts. And then I'd say the last is data literate, sorry, seven is data literate, and eight is the most important one. I think it's one that we have to call get up every day to be reflective, like who am I and how am I showing up in the world? And every day, am I committed to being right or doing great on behalf of the citizens um, or in my instance, public service? So for me, it's reflective, cooperative, persuasive, practical, experimental and adaptable. Okay, that's that's a lot of things that policymakers have to be in order to make it. And let's see if uh, Piret and Torsten have anything to add to that, because then, yeah, it would really make a long list to be ticked. Piret, what is your opinion? Yeah, it's a it's a very uh, comprehensive list from Lisa as well. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the topics is really to. I would not say that everybody has to become technology expert in the public sector, but really understanding technology and technology possibilities is something that is must a must. And also investing in especially those areas that are complementary to kind of digitalization and digital technologies in terms of the, some of the capabilities and uh, skills Lisa already mentioned in terms of creativity uh, systems thinking and others, uh, but uh, the kind of the anticipatory futures oriented design creative knowledge that actually, you know, computers and uh, they cannot provide for us. It's complementary knowledge. So it actually helps us to build together with potentially data models and, mm -hmm. and evidence created by automatization or algorithms, some new types of knowledge as well. So it sometimes it seems that it's far away from how we do policy today, but it's already on kind of the uh, additionalities to decision making tools and this is already the revolution is on the way. So we need a little bit of kind of these uh, different types of approaches to actually sense make that use creativity anticipation and uh, also the kind of the skill of facilitation of actually talking to different stakeholders and partners and to be able to generate new ideas that uh, you know any kind of computer program cannot feed into mm. us yes thank you very much Pirat. uh torsten what is your view on mm. what are this absolutely needed skills for the future uh, yes i think i think the list is already very long what i can share a uh, complementary to the uh, to the remarks made by Pirat and lisa what we see when organizing those policy learning exercises whether we are talking about the new innovation strategy, whether we are talking about the new mobility plan, very often our policymakers, our target groups are concerned with challenges related to governance. And Piret, you already said, yes, we have to look beyond our own organization. And I think all of us, dear colleagues, we know walls between departments in organizations can be high, not talking about the walls between different organizations, partners in your ecosystem. And in this regard, I think policymakers, given the exceptional character of today's world, um, they have to apply new methodologies of governments, uh, governance, some buzzwords have already been shared, agile governance, anticipatory governance, reflective governance. We have to find new ways uh, to work in ecosystems, to uh, build alliances across organizational borders. And now I will copy paste a quote for one of, from one of our community members um, with whom we are currently working on an application, peer review application. Katarina will tell more in one minute. But she said, and I, I'm sure she will, uh, she will give green light to share the quote, we have to make the silos dance. I have to say, I love this quote and I think it well summarizes um, the needs we have in today's very complex world. But this also relates to all the uh, practical skills Lisa has mentioned in order to make the silo stands for sure. We need yep. this long list of skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Indeed, let's make the silos dance. 
Um, on that note, I would like to now take maybe questions from the audience. Uh, maybe I'll ask my colleague Eugenie. And with this, I'm reminded by the fact that I uh, I made a, like a huge mistake at the beginning of this webinar for not having presented as well all my colleagues that are in the back scenes and organizing this event. So I deeply apologize to them and I would like still to name them. So Eugenie is taking care of the chat, Lotte is doing all the technical work and we also have my colleagues Elena and Magda looking in all the questions that you are typing within the chat. So thank you all and my apologies for having forgotten to properly greet you at the beginning. So now let's see some of the questions that you might have had. I, I didn't look into all the chat questions, but I, I will just say that I have seen that some people ask if the policy learning platform services are open to everyone. And the question is simple and it's yes. So the, the policy learning platform is there to be accessed and to help everybody working on uh, regional development policies. So don't hesitate to have a look and to reach out to us. We are more than happy to help you out and to provide all the information that you might need. So uh, Eugenie, maybe we can hear uh, uh, some questions or maybe one, two questions from the audience. Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, indeed, we have received some questions. Uh, we have received one question on peer reviews. So my colleague Katarina will tackle this question when she starts her presentation. Uh, we have received one question from Christiane, who is asking how to navigate through policies is the question. There are so many relations. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say the word, but it is RIS3, -R Boho's New Green Deal. So that's the first question from Christiane. Okay, so uh, to all the challenges that we have mentioned earlier, and you briefly also explained about them all, Lisa Piret Torsten in your keynote speeches, is also the fact that there are so many things going on around us. And do you have any tips on how one might better navigate between all of these? If I may start, then I think that uh, our perspective is that uh, you have to look at the policies themselves of relevancy to the purpose that you are meant to deliver. So if you are kind of a development officer or a strategy officer at the, at the region, for example, or in charge of a particular sector, you would look at the, the portfolio of uh, policies from that perspective. What is useful uh, from those policies for the field and the purpose that I want to achieve? What from those policies are in terms of support measures or otherwise is helpful in terms of the change that uh, I want to achieve? Do those policies hinder or uh, maybe facilitate the theory of change that I'm working together with, really have a kind of a portfolio approach to it. So I have a purpose to fulfill and all of these interventions and the ecosystem, um, how do they influence that purpose that I'm working with? So putting that really in the context, because otherwise, I mean, there's so many different legislation policies from the EU mm -hmm. level and downward uh, that it's impossible to navigate. But really, to make it targetable and actionable, you have to put it in the context of uh, what you're particularly doing. Okay, so to kind of try to take a step back and then to put everything into your purpose and aim. I don't know if Lisa or Torsten, you want to equally contribute to that? I'll jump in here. Um, I, this isn't the answer to all of it, but I, when I mentioned in my opening talk, um, the use of machine readable code, um, to uh, for some of this could be the answer. So it, it's quite fascinating. In many countries, you have code that um, people don't even know exists, right? There are laws on the books that people don't, laws and policies. And so there's some, some work that we could do using data and looking at how things are interconnected to one another to actually know where those interconnections are and where there might be laws that cancel each other out. So using some machine readable, a little machine learning, it's not quite there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on it, but I do think we can get better. And I just wanted a note of caution about how important it is we, we begin to get all of this right much faster is 51% of Europeans would rather replace 
politicians with AI than have politicians, even knowing the limitations of AI. So while technology can really help us, the citizens are beginning to get quite nervous and, and prefer technology to people. And so we have to get much better at customer service and using technology to help serve our citizens better. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, Thorsten? So very quickly, I would relate to my previous remark about looking beyond or uh, above the walls of your own department, your own organization. I can relate to the example I gave, Westland County, the new innovation strategy launched with the support of the policy learning platform. And 18 months later, we came back to them asking about the impact of the peer review we organized for them. And what they told us was interesting. By the way, they took the RIS-3 approach, the smart specialization approach. This relates to the question of our participant. And they said, you know, the peer review helped us to better find the place of our new RIS-3, our new innovation strategy in the policy mix of the region, because we started cooperating more closely with uh, with the other departments in our administration. We had more regular exchanges with our political decision makers. Therefore, again, missions and cross-sectorial, cross-organizational partnerships can also help, I believe, better navigate your thematic policy through the jungle of, as you say, uh, the list of legislation and policy document we are all facing. Okay, thank you very much, um, Lisa, Pirat, Torsten, for uh, having answered this question, but equally for your keynote speeches. The, our fir the first part of our event will end here, and we will now go to the to to hearing a little bit more from people that tested the services of the policy learning platform. So stay tuned to hear more about particular examples and what happened on the ground in several parts of Europe. But before that, we take a one minute video with the help of my colleague Lotte. So the video, please. <music> Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. And we're back. And of our first session, now after the break, we'll uh, dive a little bit deeper into the services that the policy learning platform is offering. And more particularly, we will discuss about our peer reviews. And I would like to welcome with us on the virtual stage uh, three speakers. And I will briefly introduce them to you. So Rumiana, Rumiana Grozeva is an executive director at Stara Zagora Reda, which is a Bulgarian organization which brings together all quadruple helix stakeholders from the region. In the last years, uh, Stara Zagora is working specifically on the just transition processes with stakeholders and partners at all levels. Currently, Rumiana is a Fulbright scholar, researcher in the International Economic Development Council. So welcome, Rumiana. We also have with us Herman. Herman Koka is an expert in circular economy and waste landfill management. He works at the Regional Ministry of Environment at the Regional Government of Andalusia. He is the Deputy Director in the General Directorate responsible for circular economy and climate change. He participated in the draft of the Andalusian circular economy law. Welcome, Herman. And last but not least, my colleague Katarina Krell, who is a thematic expert with more than 20 years experience in the areas of renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart cities, and circular economy. And with that, I will leave the floor to Katarina, uh, Rumiana, and Herman to discuss about the peer reviews. 
Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, Raluca. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, from my side. Our mini session is about the peer review service. So let's quickly recapitulate uh, uh, the concept. I've seen there is big interest in it, uh, also from the remarks in the chat. The peer review are our premium on demand expert support service. And this service is reserved for public bodies at regional and local level from anywhere in the European Union. The participation is fully independent from being a partner in an Interact Europe project uh, or not. Actually, we particularly welcome uh, newcomers to Interact Europe. And uh, the expert support can be requested anytime. There is no deadline. The application form is very short. Now, an organization that wants to benefit from a peer review typically applies to us, the policy learning platform, with a concrete policy related challenge that it would like to address with the help of peers from other European regions. Based on the description of this policy challenge, we identify and recruit four to five peers and invite these for an exchange. The peer review itself is a two day intense meeting where the invited experts will each address the policy challenge requested by um, the applicant um, organization from their experience uh, background. The process is fully moderated and supported uh, from the Indirect Europe policy learning platform team. So Romiana uh, and Herman have both participated in a peer review in a different one. And let's hear a little bit from them. And while we hear from them, I invite the audience to submit any questions you might have about this in the chat. So. Romana, you have been a beneficiary and a host uh, of a peer review in Stara Zagora in February 2020, my last business travel before the lockdown. Please yeah. tell our audience a little bit how did you learn about uh, uh, this service um, and uh, the platform and the expert support service. Uh, first, thanks for having me here, Katerina, to share my uh, personal and team experience in this uh, peer review organizing. Actually. If I should vote in the first poll, uh, I learn about the uh, policy learning platform by participating in event. Uh, it was organized in Brussels just uh, probably several months before the lockdown, before the COVID time. And uh, it was uh, part of this low carbon priority of the Interact program. I should say that actually the agency uh, is the lead partner in one of the Interact funded projects and this it was the reason to participate in this event then. And uh, I uh, learned about the policy learning platform. We discussed, then I met you on, during this event. We discussed that our project is uh, quite different from uh, almost all funded in this priority of the program. And we need uh, very specific support in order to deal with the, this so sensitive topic in the region and to engage uh, the stakeholders more and more because during the study visit, we could have one, two, maximum three stakeholders with us to uh, learn from the experience of other regions in the same uh, situation, but uh, the discussion is much more different. And this was the, the way that I've learned about the policy learning platform and decided just to, to apply to participate in uh, for a peer review. Yeah, this, it, it was the beginning, let's say. <laughs> Thank you, Romiana. And Haman, how did you learn about uh, the peer review? Yes, I, I have uh, participated in, in several Interreg projects. Uh, in one of the exchange of experience uh, of the Cocoon Interreg project, one of the partners told me about the, the Interreg learning platform. So when I received the call for peers in 2021 to participate in the peer review for the city of uh, Greifswald, I knew what this uh, was all about. So I. I take the, I engage the, the, the peer review and I participated in. Thank you, Herman. Yes, so we have one example of a peer review that took place uh, physically in Stara Zagora and uh, one example of a peer review that was organized uh, online. It was uh, during the period of lockdown where we started experimenting uh, with an online version that works also very well. And we have kept 
both formats uh, and we use them uh, flexibly right now. So, Romiana, let's talk a little bit about the workload associated uh, to first applying to the peer review and then holding the peer review directly. Tell our participants a little bit uh, uh, if that was very work intensive or how did you perceive this, please? So the application form is really short, as you said in, in the beginning of this panel. And uh, actually for our team, it was not time consuming because all of the questions that should be provided some more information there, we already have. It's just necessary to rethink and rewrite it in order to be much more um, useful for first for uh, policy learning platform team to identify the right experts which should be um, uh, involved in the peer review and after that for us also to um, assess the progress that we already made during the project implementation actually it's a decar project focused on the just transition regions in europe and um, uh, it, took, it took some normal time to prepare. I couldn't say that it's an um, uh, overload of work to, to prepare the application form. If you're uh, working in such kind of topic, such kind of project, you have all of this information already available. Probably it uh, took some more time to discuss with the stakeholders, with the policymakers at regional level. While this uh, peer review could be, uh, will be useful to have to, to be implemented um in the region and uh, actually it's also a part of this organization to uh, prepare the peer review as host i mean uh to engage stakeholders because you know all of them are so busy they have a lot of work to do a very special very uh urgent decisions should be taken etc etc no time for this but actually uh fortunately you know that the hall was full. This is the other risk that should be very well uh, assessed during the preparation. The hall to be enough uh, big in order to have all stakeholders to organize uh, translation because you know the working language is English. Uh, and um, I also couldn't say that it's an overload of, of, of uh, amount of work to be done actually. And during this all of this time we had support of policy learning platform colleagues, their experience in organizing such kind of uh, events with stakeholders, uh, what uh, should be taken uh, into consideration in advance in order the process to be smooth and uh, yeah. Uh, if I should do again, I will for sure. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, in your case, the work with the stakeholders is very important because uh, your peer review is was in the frame of discussions about coal region transition scenarios and economic and socioeconomic diversification. And you had a very diverse and large group of stakeholders in the room. I would like to hear, did the peer review help you in your work with your local stakeholders? Yes. A lot. Actually, uh, I'm really very, very satisfied for us to have this peer review in person, physically. Actually, it was the just before the COVID. We, we didn't know then that uh, what the difference should be in just one month after that. But actually, this peer review uh, allows us, allowed us to have all of the stakeholders that were cooperating in one hall with peers from other regions in the same situation and to discuss with them uh, together, I mean, not to to have three stakeholders in one meeting in, in Greece, for example, or in Germany or in Poland, but all of them joined together in one hall with these uh, peers and to discuss in person very, you know, very uh, uh, hard in some moments what is correct, what is what will work, what you will not work. Uh, Actually, the peer review allowed us to upgrade the communication, the collaboration with stakeholders as we have till the moment, because every six months we have a regularly stakeholders meeting. We discuss uh, the, the progress, what next, uh, what's new, et cetera. But during the peer review, this discussion was much more alive with all of these engaged uh, persons. And actually after that, there is some, uh, development of these uh, results, upgrading of these results, even now uh, in our job currently, two years after and half after the period. 
So that's uh, nice to hear about the impact uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, um, otherwise, uh, other from the stakeholder impact, was there another impact? Uh, did you take up any other of the recommendations of the peers? Uh, okay, we have some uh, good uh, ideas provided by peers. One of them is already in, in implementation uh, to be set up such kind of um, a regional Green Deal Committee, because in, at the national level we have, but it's very important to have such a regional because all of this uh, transition is happening in our region and with citizens, with workers, with stakeholders. And uh, it, uh, it was provided, seems to me, by the colleagues from uh, Czech Republic, which is a very similar situation. And now we're working on its uh, completing, I hope, to have these results uh, till the the end of this year or in the beginning of, of next month. That's uh, uh, encouraging uh, to hear. We always try to find uh, uh, the peers that are most relevant. And uh, if we manage, uh, then something good comes out of it. Thank you, Remyana, for this uh, 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 witnessing. Uh, Hermann, speaking about the peer review for the city of Greifswald, um, you attended as a peer. What did you think about it? Well, uh, I think it was a great opportunity for the city of uh, Greifswald uh, to be able to have this peer uh, even in the in the COVID times, uh, and they have said so uh, in the meetings that uh, we have had. The organization of, of the online event was perfect. The communication was smooth, and technically, there were no problems at, at all. Uh, they even include a simultaneous translation and everything went very easily. I think that the that the event had a lot of participation and communication between the experts and, and all the stakeholders. And it was not possible to visit the localization on site that was a, a landfill, but the issue was perfectly well addressed by the host. And I think it was an inspiring experience for all the parties involved. Yes, we have uh, asked uh, the host uh, to let a drone fly over the landfill uh, uh, yes. as a substitute uh, for the local site visit. For the visit uh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Herman, um, I mean, you as peer, you volunteer your experience, but I would like to hear, did you also get something back from the peer review on a personal level? Yeah. Yes, I, I came back uh, to Spain with uh, several technical innovation and topics for collaboration uh, projects. But I think that the very important issue to consider for the development of European policies is the relationship, the relations between the different administrations, uh, regions, etc. And behind uh, these administrations, of, of course, are, are we, the, the people who, we, who are working in, in them. Uh, so personal relations are essential in European collaboration. So above all, uh, we not only come back uh, with ideas, but we also expand our network of work contacts and possible future uh, collaborations. I think this is a, a key point and the most valuable thing uh, I bring back uh, home from this kind of experience. Yes, the networking, of course, the access uh, and knowing uh, whom then to ask uh, if you have a question in the future. Now, um, on did you bring anything back that was of benefit for the organization? Because the organization yeah. kind of dispatched you and lost your working time. Do you think the organization also benefited in some way? Uh, yes, uh, I believe that the organizers of, of this peer review had a great idea uh, to bring experts from different fields and different countries. Uh, it is always enriching uh, to listen to colleagues from other countries, either because they approach issues from a different perspective or if they approach it from the same perspective, it can reaffirm us in the past uh, we have chosen to solve a, a problem. Uh, in the case in the case of, of this peer review, I brought back several ideas to my department uh, that, that my department needs, needs to to work on. For example, the the relationship between botany and landfill sealing. And this peer review came uh, well, not came because it was online. Uh, an expert of uh, botany and contaminated land. 
and also uh, I brought back the the intent of using the the interact learning platform uh, to ask for assistance in the telematizations tele telematization of the proceedings in our area. So we submitted the, our request to the platform. It was approved uh, and this meeting took place in, in October this year. So I have seen uh, the peer reviews from both sides. That's true. Your colleagues replied for a peer review uh, uh, from our colleagues uh, from environment. Yes, very good. Hey, Darina, um, maybe yes. I can, I can, I'm sorry. I have to step in there a little bit just to say that we have some questions from the audience. Maybe we can, I can already read them out to you. So the, the first one is more general about the peer reviews. Uh, it comes from Gilles. And the question is, does the peer review happen online or are there physical meetings? For the later, is there any funding provided by Interreg Europe? I guess that's a question for me. So um, the peer reviews can happen uh, physically or online uh, as preferred. We did them at, by default uh, on site. Then we moved by default to online due to the COVID pandemic. And now we offer both options. And um, there is uh, financial support provided by the policy learning platform. When the meeting is uh, physical, the platform pays for the travel and accommodation uh, of the peer experts and also for um, simultaneous interpretation services, uh, if these should be uh, required and desired, as well as for the catering uh, for the full two days. Thank you very much, Katarina. And I will mention for Gilles as well as for everybody else that following this webinar, we will share with you uh, resources, the presentation and the different details on the services that we have presented. So you will see there more details about the peer reviews more particularly. There was another question that came in um, and it's about the stakeholders, the work with the stakeholders. It's from uh, René. And the question is, how were the stakeholders in the ecosystem mobilized and to get them interested, basically? Romiana, that's a question yeah. for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, uh, it's not always easy. As I said, the stakeholders are all a very busy person, the policy makers, um, uh, CEO of uh, big companies, etc. But actually, uh, we are collaborating with them for several years. Actually, this engagement is not a process that it happened just for because of the peer review. It's a process that is starting much more before that. Uh, uh, attract one, two, three more stakeholders. But actually, engagement of stakeholders is one of the most important uh, steps since the beginning of, the, of this process. So, because of the topic is uh, so important, so sensitive for the region, actually, we're happy to collaborate uh, uh, very closely with the stakeholders, actually, at the regional, local, regional, and national level, which are deeply involved in these processes. Even now, we have this collaboration, and the peer review actually uh, had, has a great contribution because uh, bring the experience brings the approach that would be used in, in, in the next steps. And uh, yeah, we're, this is the, the way to start to work with the stakeholders in the beginning with uh, very close relation, everyday communication with, with them. Maybe I can add uh, the uh, involvement of stakeholders is not compulsory. However, uh, we strongly encourage it. And there are topics where it is absolutely essential, like coal regions transition. You have a lot of stakeholders. Some topics are more um, internally for the city administrations. Sometimes um, there is more different departments of one uh, um, municipality involved and not so many external stakeholders. And often uh, the peer review host is using the peer review as uh, an excuse or as an occasion, a good opportunity to bring stakeholders around uh, one topic together for the first time, which was not the case uh, in the case of Romiana, who has a long tradition in many where the stakeholders were kind of time around the new topic. Thank you very much, Katarina, Romiana, Herman. Uh, it was great to hear you talk about uh, the peer reviews. We, we tried to briefly explain 
throughout the voices of our beneficiaries about the peer reviews. As I said, uh, we will come back to you with uh, some details on the service and don't hesitate to contact us and uh, we can take it from there and see depending on your need, what is the most appropriate uh, for you. Um, with this, I would like, and prior to finishing this session, I would like to launch a poll towards our audience with the help of my colleague. We would like to hear from you if you would be interested to know more about the peer reviews. Uh, the answers are quite straightforward. Yes, please contact me with more details or no, thank you. And depending on this, of course, afterwards, we will contact you uh, to uh, explain a little bit more and see, as I mentioned, what are your particular needs and how we can best respond to them. So thank you for contributing to the poll. Maybe we can close it now and to see what are the answers from the participants, uh, following which we will pass to our uh, new session. So yes, please contact me with the details. We have 67% with that. Thank you very much for your contributions. Equally to those that said no, thank you. <laughs> but we will get back to those that said yes with more details on the peer reviews. Thank you again, Katarina, Rumiana, and Herman. You stay with us. And in case people have more questions, please don't hesitate to use the chat and uh, type in whatever questions you might have. Uh, my, my colleagues and invited speakers are there to answer to you. It's my pleasure now to go to the next uh, session. So we have two more speakers to go and um, probably we will be a little bit more late than initially said. So please feel free to stay with us as long as, as you can and wish to. Hopefully this is a good start into your working week. We will talk now about policy solutions, where to find these policy solutions. And I have the pleasure to welcome with me for an interview, Lorenzo Sabatini. So Lorenzo is the Head of Research and Innovation Projects Unit for ASEF, a development agency based in Tuscany, Italy. He is a senior project manager involved in several regional, national, and European programs. Since 2011, he has equally coordinated Tuscany's regional technological district for advanced materials. Hello, Lorenzo, and welcome Hello, again. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation. It was our pleasure to have you with us. We will start with a basic question. If you would like to baby, please explain for our audience, what is your experience with the policy learning platform? Can you give us some example of activities, things that you have experienced? That would be great, please. Yes, uh, effectively, as project coordinator and participant to more than one in the regular project, I met you and other colleagues several, several times since the beginning with the first meetings in Bruxelles or in the nearest venue to my, to my region. Uh, then with the webinar during particularly the health emergency, that was the, the only opportunity to have a window of, of, of what happening in, uh, in, in Europe. And more recently, following the, the stories very linked to the uh, good practice databases and the, the, policy, the policy brief, uh, particularly in this context, the last opportunity I had to involve you in my project was one year ago when a partner, a region, had the, the need to uh, deepen um, policy measures for supporting relationships between the university and industry, particularly in, in the field of the innovation for environmental remediation that was the topic on which our project focused. And just at that time, you published a specific policy brief on it. So I contacted uh, Mark Pattinson as representative of the, of the policy uh, platform. And we agree and arrange an agenda of uh, a webinar uh, for supporting our partners, but also for inviting also the other member of our network. We, agree on a common agenda and in such web because unfortunately we were 
always in uh, in the COVID period, yeah. uh, came us to present the policy brief and particularly the the recommendation, very 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 helpful, and also uh, help us in contacting other experts coming from different network, not only uh, interreg Europe project, but also from the policy learning platform and others, so to enrich and facilitate the exchange uh, for the uh, for the pleasure of all the partner and for increasing the opportunity to uh, find the right inspiration for them uh, implement policy uh, policy improvement. This is just an example, but obviously mm -hmm. the, the more you know, uh, tools is the good practice database, uh, which we have to fill with our activities and uh, experience and practice, but from which we can also uh, get inspiration for, uh, for our activities in, in the project. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, also for mentioning the good practices database because indeed this is uh, this is the the uh, the the place that nurtures a lot of the activities of the policy in close collaboration with the Interreg Europe projects and we work with all the knowledge that you uh, generate throughout the projects in which you are involved. But if we are to talk a little bit more about uh, written resources, you mentioned the policy brief and potentially stories and other things that are coming from the policy learning platform or elsewhere. Uh, why do you think the access to this type of resources is useful for people like you that are involved in policy making? How, how do these type of publications help you to better maybe do your job? Yes, there are several uses you can do of the of the policy brief. Uh, obviously, the first is for helping you in uh, improve in deepen specific topic on which we are you are dealing with in your region for uh, for give an answer to to a need or for improve your policy instrument. All uh, policy brief give you a sort of summary of the topic addressed, give you uh, references and links to document and example, for example, to other region which already dealt with some problem. And finally, you have also recommendation in order to uh, develop before your, uh, your plan and then implement the policy the policy instrument but from my personal point of view and i suggest all people including policy maker to to use it in this sense they open a window on what happened in europe and not always uh, the right answer uh, you, you are able to, to to find the right answer in the policy brief you think is the nearest to your problem often also looking also at other uh, topics, uh, you can find a different per perspective for solving the same problem you have in another environment. And this is very precious, particularly uh, when we talk about uh, uh, exchange and, and interregional cooperation. Often not the right uh, road is the, is the right one. And also what happened Right, uh, the right solution. So, really, is important also for the professional uh, growth of the of the people and of the mm. policymaker in this kind in this case. Thank you very much, Lorenzo, for uh, briefly discussing with me today about the added value of staying up to date with what's going on in a policy field, particularly throughout written publications, because this is a policy brief. A policy brief is a written publication that we put on the website from time to time uh, that can uh, look deeper into a particular into a particular topic at some point it can be about immobility for example for our audiences or on many other things uh, the one that you particularly discussed about lorenzo maybe you can share with us what was the particular topic of the policy brief that you mentioned earlier it was about university industry collaboration right 
in the yes exactly in the framework of innovation and innovation policies yeah. so that are just some examples of what you can find in the knowledge part of the policy learning platform I would like to finish this session with a poll to the audience with the help of my colleague Lotte and the question to you is which format do you prefer for policy content? Do you prefer to read things, so in a written form? Do you prefer to see it in the form of videos? Do you prefer to listen, audio? Do you prefer to participate in events or other? And if so, please let us know. This is, will also help us to better understand for the future what type of resources we should develop maybe in your direction. So please take a moment to participate in this poll. And uh, we can maybe see now the results, which are your preferred formats. So most of you prefer to read and to participate in events, from what I see. Some of you also use video 40% and audio 11%. So thank you very much for your participation in this poll. Um, and with this, I will like to thank again to Lorenzo for his contribution. And I would like to uh, start the last session for today and thank you for staying with us. In our last session, we will talk with uh, Lambrini Zoli. Uh, Lambrini is an experienced project manager in the government administration. Her current position is in the department of EU funded projects of the Regional Development Fund at the region of Central Macedonia in Greece. Uh, thank you, Lambrini, for patiently and kindly have waited your turn <laughs> to talk and share your experience about the policy learning platform. I would like to mention that Lambrini is also, uh, as a representative of the Central Macedonia region, has been involved in several interregional projects and has experienced different policy learning platform events and activities. And I will maybe start with uh, my first question would be, as I said, you are very familiar with Interreg Europe and your region, Central Macedonia, has been involved in different, uh, different area of activities. Uh, so we see that it's an organization that is highly convinced about the idea of cooperation. And this might not be the case, as we also have heard so far, of all uh, governments around Europe. Can you tell us why do you think your region is fully committed to cooperation, please? Okay. Thank you, Raluca, from the, for the invitation and the introduction. First of all, I would like to say that our organization, the region of Central Macedonia, is fully aligned with the cohesion policy. And just to remind to everybody that cohesion policy is the European Union strategy that supports and promotes the overall a development of the member states and the regions. So to answer your question, since the Interreg Euro program and the policy learning platform promotes the development at regional level, we are fully committed to your activities. Uh, through our experience in these activities, we had the chance not only to expand our network, but also to promote our region, find solutions that they have already been proven around Europe. We all know nowadays that we don't have to build from scratch, but we can adapt and develop on what has already been done. Through our experience in the matchmaking event uh, that we have participated recently in Kanye about the coastal area, the restoration of the coastal area of Thessaloniki and also the peer review in Thessaloniki, we can say that this was a very good experience to us. It was actually a service on demand from the platform to our organization. We had the chance to hear good solutions from experts at specific topics that we wanted to know, and uh, the capacity building of our staff was improved. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I would like to mention that in the peer review that uh, was held in Thessaloniki, uh, there were some stakeholders that participated, and they were very happy for our initiative to support their sector through the services of the learning platform. Thank you very much, Lambrini, also for having mentioned this aspect of 
you having benefited of the policy learning platform as a giver, uh, some activities you were there to offer your experience and to share with others some good practices that you have developed in your region, but you were also a receiver. You, your region uh, uh, benefited of a peer review, uh, so you have benefited equally of the experience of all the others that came over to share with you their experiences. This is basically the, the reason of being of Interreg Europe and the policy learning platform, this aspect of us coming together to share our knowledge and our uh, collective intelligence so that we find better solutions for Europe's regions. My second question to you would be, what would you say to someone that is reluctant to invest maybe time and resources in this type of continuous learning activities? Why do you think they should consider this? What does it bring for to you professionally? Uh, and we saw yeah. that many people don't invest time. This is true, but uh, due to the globalization, the economic crisis, the political crisis, the war, the climate change, I think that the policymaker nowadays should not only have long-term plans, he should be able to propose new ideas when we have the problems, not after the problems occur. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice for somebody, for a policymaker, and important to participate in a community, a powerful network of policymakers around Europe uh, that uh, can help him find new solutions. If he invests his time in the services of the policy learning platform, he will be able to have new solution ideas, he will be able to improve his capacity building, uh, expand his network, and uh, find extroversion. Also, he will be able to have some uh, solutions and marketing techniques that he can adapt to his organization and generally improve his capacity building. To my, to my opinion, I think a policymaker nowadays cannot be effective uh, if he doesn't belong to a community at regional level, at least for us. And uh, that is uh, only the way to change the decisions that are made in Europe nowadays. You make a very good case, uh, <laughs> Lambrini. If we, if we haven't made the case completely up to talking to you, now we, we understand even further and more why the policymakers should be interested and involved in all this type of activities of continuous learning, sharing experience with their peers around Europe. So thank you very, very much for having been You're with welcome. us and having shared your experience. And it's time for us to uh, slowly approach the end of this event, but not without uh, thanking you a lot for having stayed with us uh, throughout this event. Uh, I would like also to thank all the speakers for uh, all their inspiration, inspirational speeches uh, and for having shared with us their experience with the policy learning platform. And just before saying uh, really bye, I would like to launch a final poll towards you. Um, where we would like to hear from you which of the presenter services you would be interested in exploring. And this will be also the occasion for me to recap for you what we have been discussing about in the second part of this event. So we have uh, presented to you the peer reviews, uh, which is one of the main services of the policy learning platform where you can come towards us and we will help you out and we will decide and bring forward to your region the proper experts and peers that can uh, help you with your policy challenge. This is the peer reviews, but we do offer different variations on the peer reviews uh, theme. Uh, they can all be found under the expert support. Then we discussed about the knowledge and the policy solutions. And here we have seen with Lorenzo about the policy briefs and the good practice database, and there's much more to explore on the Interreg Europe website. Don't hesitate to have a look. And last, with the help of Lambrini, we have discussed about the community. We have discussed about the events and what is the added value of being in such a wonderful community, which is the one of the EU policymakers. So now I suppose you have picked your choices and I would like to see what are the interests that would be of most interest to you.
see 49% with the peer review, 76% equal for the policy solutions and the community and events. Well, there's there, there are a lot of events that are coming up from the policy learning platform. We will not start uh, winter seasons mode just yet. So next week, for example, we have two events coming up, two webinars. Uh, so please check our website and you are most welcome to register because the registration is free and everybody is welcome. And on this note, uh, there was a lot to, to say and to cover in this uh, event. Thank you all for having stayed with us. I hope we managed to give you an idea about the next generation policymakers. Uh, thank you for having participated as well throughout the chat. And if there were any questions that we haven't answered, be reassured we will get back to you. Thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon. Goodbye.